Well, church, since we're jumping back into the book of 1 Peter uh, this morning, uh, I think it's important for us to get a refresher and to just get a reminder of what the book as a whole is about. And so I've said this multiple times as we've worked through the book, but since it's been four weeks since we've been in it, it's important for us to remember that Peter has picked up writing utensil and parchment for the purpose of sending an epistle, an encouraging letter over to believers in Asia Minor who are scattered abroad because of hostility. And what's the reason why he's writing? He's writing so that he might encourage them to remain steadfast. He's writing so that he might encourage them to fix their hope upon the uh, future grace that's going to be revealed when Jesus returns. He wants them to be utterly convinced of the promises of God so that in the midst of their present day sufferings, they navigate through them, they work through them, they're faithful through them in a way that God is glorified, the lost are evangelized, and they see sanctification happen in their life. He doesn't want them to waste their trials He doesn't want them to view trials as something that they need to run from and the suffering they're experiencing for righteousness sake as something they need to sequester themselves from. Hide off in the hills. No, he's saying, hey, this is the season the Lord's got you in. Be faithful. Fix your eyes upon what's to come. Live for the Lord and let's see God glorified together. So he's writing them to encourage them. He's writing them to consider the great hope that they have. He's writing them because they're experiencing persecution. Now, I think all of us would probably affirm this. When we think of persecution, what typically comes to mind? Uh, We think of men like Stephen, the first century martyr who died for his faith, right? We think of the big stoning. We think of him being uh, pummeled to death, massive stones hitting his head, vital organs as he's given a testimony to the gospel. We think of that when we hear persecution. Uh, We think of maybe the different men and women in history who have been thrown to the wild beast in the Colosseum. Uh, Maybe we think of the different martyrs that were uh, strapped to the stake and they were lit on fire in a garden party. Uh, Maybe we think of different people like the covenanters or uh, different men and women in church history who have suffered gravely. Or maybe we think of people in Africa right now or Nigeria. Like we have a picture in our mind, the apostles, whom the majority of them died for their faith. When we hear persecution, we think of the orange jumpsuits when ISIS was at its height, right? But I just want to remind us, in light of what we find in 1 Peter and what we see again and again and again, that there are different levels to persecution. Uh, Persecution as a whole has different levels. And what I mean by that is as you interact with the book of 1 Peter, what you find very quickly is that persecution is not only the worst of the worst moment when you are laying down your life for Jesus, but persecution also happens in the moments when you are being slandered, maligned, and ostracized for your faith. Has anybody ever had that happen to you because you are faithful to Jesus, faithful to declare the gospel? Maybe it was a family member, maybe it was a coworker, maybe it was a barber. I mean, who knows? Maybe it was a, a, a friend. When you're sharing truth and they just malign you, that's what these believers are going through. Uh, they're not at a spot now where they're dying for their faith. That's coming. But if we pick it up in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, we're reminded that they're in a season where there is growing hostility and they're being slandered. They're being ostracized. First Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, Peter says. Why? So that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. They're slandering them. Flip over to 1 Peter chapter 4 as we continue to get a little bit uh, more context under us. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. We read, For the time already past is sufficient for you. To have carried out the desire of the Gentiles. What's Peter saying? Your unsaved season was enough for you to get your full of sin or your fill of sin. The time is already sufficient for you to have carried that out. Will you be perfect? Absolutely not. Is there more sanctification? Absolutely yes. But do not run headlong. You see it there? The desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality and lust and drunkenness and carousing and drinking parties and abominable idolatries. Verse 4, in all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation. And what do they do? Let's say it together. They what? Malign you. They slander you. They speak evil against you. How many of you guys have had that happen? Hey, you were living this way for maybe 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, maybe 50 years. You get saved. Everything's radically changed. The people that you used to run with are saying, what happened to you? You're a fake. You're a fraud. This is only going to last for a couple of months. 
Uh, this is a whole gig. Like, uh, I know that the covers are going to be pulled. They malign you because you're no longer participating in the things that you used to joyfully do. This is what these believers are experiencing right now. Now, it's important for us to remember this context for two reasons. Number one, from the book perspective. We're about to enter into, beginning this week, through the remainder of verse, or chapter 3, all through chapter 4, and in some parts of chapter 5, really the main banner, the main theme of the book, which is how we are to navigate suffering for the glory of God. So that's the first reason why it's important to get a refresher. But number two, we, as we consider this, we begin to realize that their situation is a lot like ours. Their circumstances are a lot like ours. The type of persecution that they're experiencing in life is a lot like ours. We're not dying for our faith. Uh, they were not dying for their faith at this point. But it was abundantly clear that they were living in a world that no longer, at least in this pocket of time, viewed Christianity and Christ in the church favorably. I think all of us know, i.e. Olympics, that we're in an interesting time nowadays, right? And we don't need to harp on that. I think we've, it's funny, I was listening to sermons 10 years ago and even further back. And when they get to this text, everybody's like, doomsday, doomsday, it's the worst it's ever been. It's going to get worse. Okay, it's going to get worse. In 10 years, somebody's going to listen to this sermon and they'll be like, okay, yeah, it's gotten a lot worse. The reality is we live in dark times and it will continue to be dark. But in dark times, the light of the church shines brighter and brighter and is more impactful. And so it's important for us to understand that their situation, their circumstance is like ours. And so the truth that they receive is truth that we need to desperately lock into. So what we're going to see this morning is this vital truth. Let me give you the big idea. Let me give you the take-home truth. It'll be on the side screens. If you are not a note taker, I'd encourage you to be a note taker. Write in your Bibles, write on a piece of paper so you can examine these things to make sure that what's being said from the pulpit, whether it's me or another man, is actually what's in the text. Don't take our word for it. Go back to the word of God. Here's the take-home truth. It's a sermon in a sentence. Suffering for doing what is good is a sign of God's blessing. Suffering for doing what is good, you could say suffering for righteousness sake, suffering for Christ is a sign of God's blessing in your life. It is a sign of God's blessing. To see this, I just want to consider as we look at verse 13 through 17, uh, four observations in this text. Four observations that will drive us to this big idea that I believe sits in this text and on this text. And so let me give them to you up front. We're going to see the rhetorical question, number one. Uh, we're going to see the blessed promise, number two. Uh, we're going to see the precepts prescribed, number three. And then we're going to see the countercultural conviction, number four. So let's pick it up in number one, the rhetorical question. The rhetorical question. We see this in verse 13 with a very interesting statement that Peter gives. He says, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? So right off the bat, these words remind you and I, and it would have been a reminder to them as they interact with Peter's instruction to them that Peter's a realist in so many ways. Uh, he is a realist and he is arduously re realistic. And what I mean by that is he doesn't want these believers who are experiencing a season of hostility to become fatalistic. Uh, he doesn't want them to swing the pendulum all the way over where they fall into this doomsday mentality as if all of their life will be suffering for doing what is good. He wants to guard against that. He doesn't want them to think that their life will be a perpetual and unending experience of suffering for doing what is good. Look at it, verse 13 again with me to see this. He says, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? This is a rhetorical question. I mean, the answer is clear. He's, he's, he's calling for no one. No one. It's not common for an individual to harm a person who is passionately focused and fixed upon doing good. He says, in a sense, by asking this rhetorical question, find me the individual. Point the person out who is willing to persecute and to do harm to the one who is gracious and who is generous and who is truthful, a person who has integrity, a person who is selfless, a person who serves others, a person who is thoughtful. He says, point them out. It's clear right here. And I think you can sense it and feel it. But if not, let me just clarify what Peter's doing. He's speaking proverbially. See, when we go to the book of Proverbs, those aren't promises. They're, they're, they're truisms. They're statements that are generally true when we follow them, but sometimes they do not prove to be true. 
He's speaking in proverbial language, a truism. So he's saying, by and large, if you are a good person, people will pay you no mind. People will not harm you. He's doing what Solomon does in Proverbs 16, 7, when he says, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's a proverb statement. We know that there are situations where that's not the case. It's proverbial language. John MacArthur, when speaking about this verse, he says, it is unusual for most people, even those who are hostile to Christianity, to harm believers who prove zealous for what is good. Now, I think if we just take pause, I I, I don't think we would argue with that too much, will we? Our experience in life, by and large, has been this, especially in our American context. We can go to different continents and talk about it, but let's just consider it from our vantage point. By and large, for the past 200 years, we have been fine. Uh, We lived in a positive world where the world looked upon Christianity for many years as a positive thing. Uh, We moved into like a neutral world where the world was really indifferent to Christians in their beliefs. Now we're in a negative world where things have changed. But by and large, the world, if we are good people and we do things that benefit society, they do not seek to do us harm. Yet, as realistic as Peter is, he does not allow his realism to blind him from the words of his Lord and what he has told him in his ministry of discipleship to him. John 15, if they hated me, they will hate who? You. If they persecuted me, they will persecute who? You. And also, he's not unaware of the situation in which these believers are going into. Again, this is the reason why he picked up pen and parchment to write to them. So he moves from the rhetorical question over to the blessed promise. So he gives this safeguard, and now he moves into really the theme that's going to carry through the majority of the rest of the book, because these believers are suffering. He wants to begin by giving them a blessed promise. Where do we see this? We see it in the first part of verse 14. He says, but even if, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. I trust that you can feel what he's doing right there. Um, He is still approaching his instruction from a point of and a posture of realism. He, he wants to safeguard them from a pessimistic type of thinking. In fact, it's in the Greek here as well. The word should suffer. If you want to circle that, it sounds very smart in mission group, right out to the corner, put optative, O-P-T-A-T-I-V-E, verb. Throw that one out there in mission group. Everybody will think you went to seminary. Optative, what is that speaking about? It's speaking about a possibility. He says, even if you should suffer, perchance you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. Yet, again, with the word but, it's abundantly clear that he is aware that he knows people's consciences will be so warped at times. People's worldview will be so twisted at times. People's ethic will be so inside out, upside down at times that people will actually search out the very people that are ardent about doing good for all men and they will purposely do harm to them and persecute them. He's fully aware of this. This is what they're going through. Again, 1 Peter chapter 4, they're being slandered for their faith. And what Peter wants them to know and what he wants you and I to know is this. When that happens, That is not an indication that you are out of God's blessing. It is an indication that you are squarely in the blessing of God. Very important to remember that. This is Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 through 12. He says the same thing. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil things against you. Slander. Why? Because of me. Rejoice and be glad, he says, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets, guess what? They will persecute you. See, you're blessed. Now, the question is, how are we blessed? Well, we're blessed because we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. There is a future fulfillment of the kingdom, but spiritually speaking, we have been transferred to Colossians 1 from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. We're citizens of the kingdom. But not only are we citizens of the kingdom, guess what? When we endure suffering for righteousness sake, there is reward being stacked up in heaven for you and I. Peter says you are blessed. 
Jesus says you are blessed. Brothers and sisters, when we suffer for righteousness sake, guess what? We are blessed at that moment. We're blessed. But not only are we blessed because we have a share in the kingdom, and not only are we blessed because we have future reward, but we're also blessed because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in that moment. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4 with me. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 through 14. Peter goes on to say, beloved, again, this is the sustained theme throughout the remainder of the book. Even when you get to chapter 5, he sprinkles it in. Suffering for the glory of God. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. Don't be taken off guard, Peter says. But to the degree that you share the suffering of Christ, keep on rejoicing. Why? So that at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. Verse 14, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Why? Because the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. You remember, Stephen? I took us there about six weeks ago. You remember Acts chapter seven? This man is about to be pummeled for his faith in the Lord Jesus. He has just declared the gospel. He's testified the truth. He's called them to repentance. He declared truth that pricked them in the conscience. He knew his life was about to end. And we get this little marker in Acts chapter seven saying that he was full of the Holy Spirit and he continued to declare the truth, even though he knew his life was gonna end. The spirit was moving and active in that moment in his life. When you and I are suffering for righteousness sake, guess what? We are a perfect candidate for the Spirit's ministry in that moment. The Spirit is moving. We are blessed. See, the blessed life, I think for many, and Lord willing, none in this room, is the pursuit of health, wealth, and happiness. The blessed life for many is the pursuit of vices and things of this world. Uh, the, pursuit, uh, the blessed life for many is the pursuit of comfort and leisure and money and job status and position and popularity, big Instagram following, being known by thousands, um, having people talk about you. Like that's the blessed life for so many. What we see right here is the true blessed life is a life of following Jesus, not only in the high moments, but even in the valleys for his namesake. That's the blessed life. Which when we really think about that, that speaks to the character of the one that we are attached to. The fact that we can follow when things are good, but also when they're hard and know that we still will receive and experience blessing. And there's nothing better than that. And so Peter gives, number one, he gives a rhetorical question. Number two, he moves on to the blessed promise. And then number three, he moves on to a lot of action now, the precepts prescribed. These are the actions that we're being called to embody. And we'll see this in the second part of verse 14 through 16. Look at verse 14 with me, the second portion of it. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. Just by a show of hands, whose version of God's word has that capitalized? Show of hands. Okay, not everyone. So for those who have it capitalized, that is telling you that that is a quotation from the Old Testament. So what Peter's doing right here in verse 14 and in verse 15, by and large, is he's pulling from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 12 and 13. There's a lot happening on, but if I just boil it down, it's this. The prophet Isaiah is telling King Ahaz, do not be fearful of the king of Assyria. Do not fear man, but fear God. And Peter as he often does, he grabs onto Old Testament truth, he contextualizes it for a present day situation, and he does it here, and he tells these believers, do not be afraid, despite what you feel, despite the anxiety of your heart, of those who would seek to do you harm. Don't be troubled. It's the picture of having water in a glass and shaking it, and the water is just going all over the place. That's the word, terrazzo. It's troubled, it's turmoil. It's the picture of seeing an ocean or maybe a lake where the winds are blowing and it's super choppy. He says, don't allow that to happen. Don't be knocked off course. Don't be shaken up by what you are seeing and what you are facing. Now, the question that we begin to ask is how? Is how? You and I are naturally fearful people, are we not? I think when we let the machismo go down, you know what I mean? There's, there's situations for all of us that we are immensely fearful of. And it, oftentimes we're fearful when we are confronted as followers of Jesus by the world. There's fear that wants to rise. So the question is, how, how do we actually do what we're being called to not fear and give into intimidation? I think the answer is found in the positive instruction in verse 15. 
Look at verse 15 with me. But, so do not do this. Do not fear. Do not be intimidated. Do not be troubled. But what should you do? Sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Uh, the word to sanctify right here in reference to Christ means to reverence Christ. Uh, when you and I are sanctified, if you have trusted Jesus, that has happened for you. You have been sanctified. You have been set apart. You have been made holy. You realize that, right? It's the beauty of salvation. We are unholy people, yet the Lord sets us apart, not only from the world, but unto Himself. We're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. When the Father sees us, He sees the merits of Christ. We're holy. We're set apart. Yet, when we're called to set Christ apart in our hearts, are we making him holy? No, we're not making him holy. He is the holy one. We can't make him more holy than he already is. What we're doing is we're acknowledging his holiness. We're acknowledging his lordship. We're acknowledging his beauty. We're acknowledging his splendor. We're acknowledging who he is, and we are giving him the rightful place in our heart. That's what it means to sanctify him as Lord. We obey his word and his commands, recognizing that he is Lord over all and he is our Lord uniquely as the one who has saved us and we live for him. Now, where is this to happen? It's in the heart, in the very core of who you are. This is not an intellectual thing. This is a heart thing. Uh, this is not a, a religious thing. This is a transformational thing. Uh, this is not something that can be accomplished in the flesh. This is something that has to be accomplished by the spirit of God in you. Listen to what Alexander McLaren said in reference to this idea of sanctifying Jesus in our heart. He goes on to say, to set Christ in your heart is to set him on the pedestal and the pinnacle that belongs to him. And then to bow down before him with all reverence and submission. He says, be sure you give him all that is his due and in the love of your hearts, as well as in the thoughts of your mind, recognize him for who he is and what he's done. He is the Lord. See, many of us only see a part of the whole Christ. He is our creator, but he is also our redeemer. He is our judge, as well as our savior. And then he ends saying, embrace the whole Christ and see to it that you do not dethrone him from his rightful place or take from him the glory that is due his name sanctify Jesus as Lord in your heart. So let me just ask, is he Lord of your heart? At this moment, if you were to, to crack open, now we're not talking about the physical organ, we're talking about the will center, but if your heart was a sanctuary, would the congregants within you be bowing and bending and worshiping Jesus or would they be worshiping something else? What is Lord in your heart? Is it money? Is it comfort? Is it possessions? Is it sex? Is it a career? Is it maybe even having the perfect family? Is it kids? Is it marriage? We can go on and on and on. Maybe it's even serving. What's Lord? Is it Jesus? Is he unrivaled in your heart? We need help with this. We live in a world that is ever dragging our hearts back down to worship and fall in love with things that do not deserve our affection as we give them. We need help in this. Lord, help us in this. Just the beautiful thing. He's calling us to something that brings a great, uh, let me actually rephrase that, not great, an infinite amount of joy, yet we settle for so less. He's not calling us to something that is not worth it. He's calling us to himself. We need to sanctify him as Lord in our hearts. Is he Lord in your heart? Is he on the throne? You see, when he is, you and I will be positioned and ready to do what the next part of verse 15 says. Look at it with me. Always. Always, not sometimes, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account. Do you get the picture? Courtroom or corner? Cubicle or barbecue? In front of the prosecutor or in front of a family member? 
no matter the circumstances of legal situation or a familial situation, when Christ is Lord, when he is supreme, when he is our focal point, when he is our affection uh, focal point, you and I will be ready to make a defense. And what's the defense of? Hope. You see that? Very important. I love that word. Hope. Paul often uses faith. Peter grabs onto the word hope. They're very synonymous in any ways because they're talking about this thing called salvation. But I love the fact that Peter grabs onto hope as he talks about our salvation because he's writing to beleaguered Christians who need to be reminded of what they have received in the Lord. See, not only do we have faith in the Lord and we trust him and we're a people of faith, but we're also people of hope. And when we go through hard times, we need to be reminded of that. We're to give a account. It's the word apology, not as if we're sorry, but the word apologetics is where we were to give a reasonable defense for the hope that is within us. There are plenty of examples of this. The one that comes to mind is Polycarp for me. The Bishop of Smyrna, first century bishop. He was discipled under John, uh, the apostle. Uh, He was an integral figure in pushing back heresy within the first century and then part of the second century. Many of you guys, if you're familiar with church history, remember how he died. Church history says that he was on the stake and he was being burned alive. The problem is the flames weren't actually consuming him to the point where they had to stick him through with the spear so that his life would expire. That man right here, I think, is a perfect example of what it means to give a reason to count for the hope that is within you. When he was being charged with blasphemy, he was given the chance to recant. And this is what he said, 86 years I have served Jesus and he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? When the proconsul threatened to expose him to the wild beast, he replied, it is well for me to be speedily released from this life of misery. Finally, the ruler threatened to burn him alive. And what did Polycarp say? I fear not the fire that burns for a moment. You do not know that which burns forever and ever. That's a defense right there, right? That's a defense. But not only are we called to make the defense, notice we are called to make the defense in a specific way with gentleness and reverence. You see it there? How we make this defense matters. Gentleness. This emphasizes, brothers and sisters, that we have to have a heart for the soul of the person that we are making a defense for, too. We need to have moist eyes when we are evangelizing and giving in a reasonable defense for the hope that is within us. We're not making a defense for the sake of making a defense. We're not making a defense for the sake of winning an argument. We're making a defense so that that person who has no hope might hear about our hope and receive that hope through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it is to be done in reverence. Hope is, or gentleness, is our way of interacting with those whom we're speaking with. Reverence is how we make a defense before the eyes of God. We're to do it in such a way that we are fully devoted to the honor of our great God above all. See, our salvation should flavor our defense of the gospel and the hope that we have. You and I should not be an arrogant people. You and I should not be a boastful people. Uh, You and I should not even be a harsh people. We are to be a gentle people, allowing the truth of God's word to be the means that offends the lost. But not only does it change how we make our defense, notice with me verse 16. It also changes the character of our conduct. It matters how we live. He says, and keep a good conscience. Keep a good conscience. The conscience is, I would call the alarm system that's within us. It's the thing that God has implanted within us that tells us this is right, this is wrong. A couple of things about the conscience. First, every person has a conscience. Romans chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Second, the conscience can be weak. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. It could actually mislead us. Third, the conscience can actually be defiled. Titus chapter 1, verse 15. Fourth, the conscience can be seared. We can do so much damage to it that it does not give is a stimulus anymore as it ought to. First Timothy 4, 2. Fifth, our conscience can be evil. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. And then lastly, and most importantly, our conscience can be cleansed. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Listen to what the author of Hebrews says. It says, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, 
cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You and I have a clean conscience. If you remember, if you genuinely have been saved, there was a moment when you were under the weight and the reality of your shame and your sin. I mean, that's what the Lord does. He brings us low. He he makes us poor in spirit. We realize all that we are not. And there is this heaviness pressing upon you that you just want relief from. The conscience is convicting you. Well, when you're saved, your conscience is cleansed at that moment. And what Peter tells us is that cleansed conscience needs to be your primary focus on keeping it in a good and right condition. There are many things that we keep in good condition, right? Cars, cards. Some of us have card collections of 10,000, 20,000 cards. Maybe China that's been passed down from generation to generation to generation. Maybe it's a family heirloom. Like we go above and beyond to keep certain things in a very pristine condition. How much more our heart? How much more the conscience that is needed to lead and guide us as it's informed by the word of God towards the pathway of righteousness? And what's the reason why? We want to stay tethered to the context. What's the reason why we need to have a good conscience? Well, in particular here, Look at verse 16, so that, this is a purpose clause. This is given us the reason. So that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. See, a believer with a good conscience is a bold believer. There will be times when people will levy accusations against you that are not true. And if they're not true, guess what? You have a clean conscience before the living God who knows your actions and knows your heart. And you can stand before those accusations, no matter how hurtful they are, and know that you are right before the living God. But the converse is when those who are seeking to slander you are bringing things against you that you know deep down are true, that blunts your ability to be effective witnesses at that very moment. It brings a reproach against the name of Christ. He said, the thing in which you slander, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to to shame. So we got to keep it in a good condition. And then he tells us why. So that those who revile you may be put to shame. We don't know when this will happen. This may happen in the here and now. Uh, This may happen under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. This may happen at the moment of judgment when their deeds are unfurled before them and they recognize the foolishness thereof. Or it may happen when somebody comes along and they see their actions against you or another believer and they call them to the carpenter. There will be a moment of shame. We don't know when the application of that will happen, but we trust that it will happen. And this is a reminder for us. When we talk about persevering for Christ, there's two primary motivations. Number one, it's looking back. We look back at the cross. I live for Jesus because Jesus did this for me. I die to self because Jesus died for me. I worship Jesus because Jesus laid down his life for me. We look back so that we can press forward. But the other motivation is to fix our eyes upon promises future that compel us and drag us and encourage us to press on maybe when we want to actually give up. And this is one of those right here. Those who slander you will be brought to shame. God is the great vindicator. God brings perfect justice. And so Peter gives the rhetorical question. He gives the blessed promise. He gives the precepts prescribed. Let's end it in verse 17 with number four, the countercultural conviction. He ends by giving a countercultural conviction. See this in verse 17. Four. That's a, a, a word that's providing reason. Why keep a good conscience? For it is better. It's better. If God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. Now, let's just be honest. This tests your and my understanding of the goodness of God, does it not? And if we peel it back a little bit more, it tests not only our understanding intellectually, but it tests our commitment to believing that God is unremittingly good. You see, as unbelievers in Iraq with verse 17, they wonder what in the world type of God would allow his people to suffer? And actually, see it there. I mean, this is in the word of God. If God should will it, not only allow it, but even appoint it 
for righteous to say, what type of God is that? And on first pass, we would say that's a valid question unless we know the character of our God, unless we know that God is good, that God is faithful, that God is all wise. Have you ever considered that? That not one aspect of your God's outworking of his will is out of his perfect wisdom. Everything he does is good. Everything he does is wise. Everything he does is perfect. And everything he does is for his glory and our good and our joy. See, when we know that, you and I can look at verse 17 and be able to say, it is better. Can you say that today? It is better if I suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. See, the person who can say that will be the person who has made sanctification, being conformed to the image of Christ, their chief aim in life. See, because that's when the chief aim is that, guess what? You're willing to let go of, even if it means suffering for righteousness sake, the things of this world that are keeping you from being conformed to the image of Christ. You will see that God works in the midst of suffering for righteousness to make you like like Jesus. The person who will be able to look at verse 17 and affirm this will be a person who knows that God's chief aim is to get glory for himself. And if he's getting glory for himself through my suffering for righteousness sake, it's worth it. See, the person who will be able to affirm verse 17 will be the person who is fully convinced that God is always at work. And his work, even in our suffering for Christ, is always good. Like I said in the beginning, this is really the front door into the rest of the book of 1 Peter, where we're going to be in a sustained exposition on how we interact with suffering and navigate suffering as the people of God. But in preview to next week, I just want to take you to verse 18 in conclusion. I want to take you to verse 18. Because it's vitally important, and we'll unpack it next week, that if you and I are going to be people who suffer for righteousness sake in a way that pleases the Lord, it's vital that we have our eyes fixed upon Christ. Because he is the chief example of what this looks like. Look at verse 18, 1 Peter chapter 3. For Christ also died for sins, once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. What's Peter doing? He says, it's better to suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. For, in essence, Jesus is the greatest example of this. He followed the father's will. He suffered for doing what is right. And guess what the fruit was from that? You and me. His blood was shed for you and me. His righteousness was transferred to you and me. He's our greatest example. So let me just end by asking this very question and putting before you this very reality. Uh, Have you trusted Jesus? Uh, have Have you followed him? Is he your chief treasure? When we talk about being a disciple, that's all it is. It's seeing Jesus as chief treasure in our life renouncing the things of the world, trusting that he paid the sin penalty for my sin and I'm following after him no matter what comes. Have you trusted in him? Have you believed that he accomplished what you could not accomplish? Are you burdened by guilt and shame and the weight of your sin this morning? I've got good news. There is one who can lift that because he is the one that paid for that. And all you gotta do is trust him to experience the joy of the forgiveness that he died to give. Believe in Jesus today. And this is the promise. And I love this promise. For those who come to him, guess what? He will never cast out. You are perfectly safe and hidden in Christ when you trust in him. So believe in him today. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity uh, to study it. We thank you for the truth that's here. And I pray, Lord, that in all of my inadequacy, uh, you would throughout the week preach this truth through the Spirit's ministry in our life, Monday through Saturday, until we uh, come back into this room in a way more effective than I have been able to. I pray that though we may not be in seasons of suffering for doing what is right, we may not be in seasons of suffering for righteousness' sake, um, we recognize that 
While that will not be our unending experience, there will be times when that will happen. And I just pray and ask that we would be a people that are equipped to navigate that in such a way where we recognize how blessed we are, and we recognize that we are citizens of the kingdom, and this is a marker of our citizenship. We recognize that we have a reward in heaven, and that in this moment, the Spirit is moving and active, and we get to see your power at work in us. And so make us a people prepped and ready. If there's anyone here that, that doesn't know Christ, call them to yourself, Lord. I think the greatest thing we can do is pray for them to heed the call of the gospel. And it's impossible to come to Christ apart from the Spirit's help. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd move. Move in their heart right now. Convict them of sin. Bring them to a point of desperation. And then show them where the relief can be found none other than the person of Christ. And as we stand in a moment to sing in light of our time of study, the truths of how great you are, uh, may we do it with the fullness of heart and full joy as we consider and retrace your goodness in our life. We love you, Lord. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.